Hi, Open Source Summit. Hi, Shimon. Hi, Noah. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? It's great. It's great. I'm so excited. Uh, you know, the Linux Foundation always has a special, special, special place in, in my heart. heart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you stole my words. Uh, yeah, so it's really, really fun to be here. And it's really fun also to talk about things from uh, the Cloud Native Foundation, which is like Open Policy Agent and ConfTest and Gatekeeper and Kubernetes. So, you know, all words collide yeah. uh, in a way. So what are we going to talk about today? Today we are going to talk about why policies are so important in Kubernetes. We'll talk about OPA, uh, Gatekeeper, ConfTest, why to use it, how to use it. And we're also going to talk about our the tree. Right? Yeah. So um, we'll show code snippets. We'll show you real-world examples of post-mortems, of production outages that happen to some of the greatest companies in the world. So stay tuned and uh, let's get started. So um, we talked about this. Yes. Okay. So a little bit about us. So uh, Noah? Yeah. My name is Noah, Noah Barke. I'm um, here from Tel Aviv, Israel. And I'm a full stack developer for more than five five years. Um, I'm also a tech writer and one of the leaders of GitHub Israel community, which is the largest GitHub community in the whole world. No, in the whole universe. Ooh. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. yeah and uh, my name is Shimon Toltz. I'm the CEO and co-founder of The Tree. Um, I'm... I love tech conferences, um, I love communities, I run the largest AWS community worldwide, there's an AWS community hero, nice. we have 8,000 members and we did more than 100 gatherings. 8,000? Really? Yeah, that's what happened to be. Wow, um, so fast. Yeah, and uh, my background is in software development, backend DevOps, uh, prior to starting the tree I was the general manager for the infrastructure division for Iron Source. Is a nice company that IPO'd uh, like a couple of months ago for $11 billion. And it was really, really interesting, you know, joining when we were just 30 people. And after, like, when I left, we were like 1,000 people. Wow. And um, a lot of the challenges that we're going to talk about today, really, I had to face them there as well with the 400 engineers. And it's really hard scaling Kubernetes and uh, all of the development standards for 400 engineers. It's really interesting to see that it's not the hype, you know, the hype that became uh, began this year, you know, about Kubernetes and everything. So you felt it three years ago, four years ago. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. We were born in the cloud. We started with microservices right from the get go. So we like we kind of felt the pains of the future as all of the companies were migrating to the cloud and moving to you know those uh, development architectures. Amazing. Cool. So a little bit about the tree and then we'll just get over it. So we help uh, companies prevent uh, misconfigurations from reaching production in uh, Kubernetes workloads. So we have a cool open source CLI written in Go in GitHub. Go check it out. Submit a pull request. <laughs> yeah, me and Noah, we wrote code to this CLI. And um, it will actually run against your Kubernetes manifests and the uh, Helm charts and identify any misconfigurations like... <laughs> the ones that we're going to show you soon, and to make sure that you have a memory limit, CPU limit, a liveness probe, readiness probe, and actually you can write policies as code as you like, and you can also build your own custom policies. So it's an entire engine for you to play with. So, Shimon, you may be born in the cloud, but I born in the policies, because <laughs> policies is what we do for a living here. And with this knowledge, I would like to tell you a story. I would like to tell you the story of unicorn rentals. Oh, I love unicorns. I dressed as a unicorn for Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, unicorn rentals started like every other company. The two founders, two developers, and everything was great. Business were booming. Who wouldn't want to buy a unicorn? Uh, yeah, sounds like a, uni a, unicorn, a unicorn company. Unicorn. Yeah, it's like of course. So the company started to grow. They cre uh, they recruited more developers. They started to deliver more and more features um, in the fastest way that they could. And what happens? What happens when you have more developers, more features? Your delivery pace. <laughs> 
and you ran fast, I guess you start to break things. Yeah, you have more bugs. And to have more bugs can be a very serious problem, especially when you have more and more customers and you want your production to be more and more stable. So what do you do? You start to recruit more DevOps engineer. You switch to Kubernetes, maybe Helm, you know, more uh, sophisticated uh, infrastructure. And you want to make sure that you delegate the knowledge to the developers' teams. So it won't be only the DevOps. Yeah, makes and sense. Yeah, and that is exactly what Unicorn Rentals did. I swear, they even sent an, an email to, <laughs> guys, don't <laughs> forget to use the memory limit. It's super, super important. Don't forget it. And this is how they lived. And they live happily ever after. But do you think that sending emails to developers, asking them to do things is the right thing? Mm, you're, you're, <laughs> it's a spoiler. It's a spoiler. <laughs> But, you know, a little while later, <gasps> something horribly oh happened. God. Oh, oh no. Oh, oh, no. One of the developers uh, just pushed a resource and he forgot one tiny, tiny th little mm. thing. He forgot the memory limit. Oh. Which pretty immediately caused a memory leak. And the cluster went down and... So there was a memory leak in the application and the application did not have a memory limit. So it actually made a blast radius for the entire node in the cluster. Yes, indeed. Makes sense. And I think it's safe to say that it was a Friday night and it was <laughs> 4 a.m. <laughs> always, always. Always is. Friday night. So um, Unicorn Rentals is actually not so special. It, in fact, it happened to a lot of companies. Google, Spotify, Airbnb. Really, it can really happen to anyone. And it doesn't have to be, you know, complex issues or something that is very, very drastic or anything. It can be what happened to Zalando when they actually put the correct configuration, but incorrectly in the resource that they, they put. Uh, it's the right thing at the wrong place. Yeah, they had a cron <laughs> job and they placed it not in the cron job spec. So the concurrency oh. wasn't part of the cron job spec and they ended up with having a cron job without any limits. Oh, so like even if you... You put in the configuration, but because it's like a YAML file, you can yeah. put it in the wrong section, yeah. and then it won't actually register as the... Mm -hmm. and, Man, and it's so it's easy to make those mistakes. Yes, yes. And it was it was a valid file. So when they did kubectl, kubectl apply, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was okay. It was fine. But it, it wasn't. As you can ask them. But, and it can also be p to put a star in your ingress and then to forward all the traffic to one container, one container to an entire cluster, and that's what happened to Target. It was their first accident, actually, in Kubernetes. Accident it and incident. Incident. Both at the same time. Incident, <laughs> you're, you're right. No, but I, I agree, because then it's, it's problems that are easy to make. So instead of like specifying the host in the ingress, you just put star. Yeah. Which is a weird default behavior. Like I wouldn't think that the default behavior of star is like route all traffic to me. It's kind of weird. Really? When I first saw it, I was... Is this the right way to do it? My, maybe it, it was my hunch. No, I think that the default behavior of if you put star, like to route all traffic to your container, like to from all ingress, I think it's kind of weird. I don't know. Um, but this is to the Kubernetes spec writers. I'm, I'm not going to argue with them. Um, I think another example here is that um, if we look at the Blue Matador incident, what happened is that they brought a third-party container, third-party service to run in their Kubernetes, like many do. Like you can bring a database, you can bring a cache, you can bring a lot of different things, uh, logging, memory, and so on. And what happened is that they did not uh, specify the limits and requests In this case, like memory limits and requests, you can do the same for CPU. And then when you bring third-party applications to your Kubernetes cluster, you don't know how they're going to behave. Maybe they have a memory leak. Maybe they have a CPU hog. Maybe there is an issue. And in their case, unfortunately, because they did not put a limit, it actually hogged the entire cluster and yeah. took all the resources. Yeah. Actually, you know, it happened to me once when we uh, spin up a rabbit, rabbit MQ queuing service. And the default behavior is to accumulate all the memory available for it to be used as uh, queuing services. 
So the default behavior is like to steal all the memory from all the other instances. So if like you don't know it, you're immediately going to kill your cluster. Wow, this is I like can't the, believe it. This is like the downside or the dangers of like not running in real VMs or like running in con containers in Kubernetes that those kind of things can happen. And this is why it's really important to put in limits. Yeah, sometimes you just use, I don't know, a third-party application and you, you trust that application, but... You need to always I mean, make maybe sure. Maybe it's doing the right thing. It's just the default behavior of the right yeah. thing is to take your entire memory. <laughs> the default behavior. <laughs> I love the default behavior when it comes to Kubernetes. You should never trust the default behavior. Yeah. But everything is... Okay, so Google, Spotify, we talked about it. But the real question, how can you prevent it in the future? This is the real question. And this is what we want to talk about oh, today. So... One option is to have all your DevOps to review everything that the developers do, every, th mm -hmm. every change. Mm -hmm. But that's an anti-pattern because you have one DevOps and an entire team of developers which pretty much afraid from everything that's related to DevOps and Kubernetes. Yeah. So what, what can you do? Yeah, I guess I agree that it's a totally an anti-pattern to... to turn DevOps or operations or SREs or, you know, the different companies call them different ways. Like yeah. I, I see it as like turning them into human YAML debuggers <laughs> of like <laughs> doing code reviews. And, and it's not even like, it's not like maybe you could write this code in a more elegant way or more memory efficient. It's basically you put it in the wrong section or you're missing a memory limit. It's like nothing interesting about it. Like, I guess as a person who, who did a lot of, like, infrastructure work, you want to do the interesting things. You want to go, you want to do cost optimization, you want to yeah. do performance optimization. Let be a human debugger to developers. And the developers don't want to wait for you to deliver their features. And you don't want to babysit the developers to make the changes. Yeah, yeah. And when we talked about it, Shimon and I... What's supposed to be the solution in this case? I, I immediately said to Shimon, Shimon, let's put the cards on the table. I'm a developer, you're a DevOps, and we are very different people. When I get up every morning, I want to be the, the feature machine. I want to deliver my features way before my, my product manager even thought about them. But when it comes to Kubernetes, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm too afraid. This is not my area. I'm there in the development phase. I'm, I'm, yes, I understand CI, CD, everything is great, but I'm, I'm there with the code. But Sh Shimon is different. Sh as, a div as a DevOps engineer, his mission every day when he wakes up every morning is not my mission. Yes, it's not delivering features. No. It's, it's making sure that the cluster is healthy. It's making sure that we have cost allocations, that we do cost reductions, that we, we're running in a performant way, that we update the versions of our clusters, that they are secure, that they are properly configured with the cloud vendor or the on-premise solution that we have. But you know what we do have in common? What? Not only that we we both working on the same pipeline, but we both want to make sure that our production is stable. Yep. I want to make sure that my features are stable in the production and that I would never, never take down the production. And yeah, no one wants to take production. No, out. nobody. So that conclusion implied that the ultimate solution will probably must be somewhere along the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the CI section, maybe in the production section. Maybe in the CD, maybe, maybe in the in dev the cycle, maybe yeah. in your ID. Maybe. <laughs> but um, but it's it's got to be somewhere along the pipeline. So today we are going to talk about three tools. We'll talk about Gatekeeper, the tree, and ConfTest. And every one of them is placed in, in a specific section in, in, the, in the pipeline. And I really want you to think about where would be the most suitable place for you because the place that you will choose to deal with the policies, to deal with um, standards and validation in your Kubernetes might affect your entire organization. And maybe you can use all. And maybe you can use all. That's true. That's also true. So let's start with OPA. 
But wait, you said confidence gatekeeper in the tree. You didn't say Opa. Why, why are you talking about Opa now? Um, um. I remember the first time <laughs> that I heard about Opa. I went to Shimon and I said to him, okay, so I understand. Policies is like when I write tests to my code. Uh-huh, it's like uh-huh. uh, to make sure that I uh, use clean code and I have my own standards and convention and best practices. This is what I need to do uh-huh. to make sure that my code is valid and it's ready to go to production. Uh-huh. Everything is okay. My integration test, my unit test, everything. What is your policies? And then Shimon looked at me and he said, Opa. We, and <laughs> I, I really need to um, explain this joke because in Hebrew, <laughs> when you want to celebrate things, you say, Opa, Opa. Opa. <laughs> and I was very, very <laughs> confused when he told me that because... We, we have a band <laughs> called Opa Hey, which was very popular 30 years from now. And I looked at him and I said, really? Are you sure? <laughs> and he explained to me that this is not the Opa that he meant. So what is Opa? Great. So Opa stands for Open Policy Agent. And the Open Policy Agent is uh, an open source project in Go that is part of the Cloud Native Foundation. And it is actually the underlying infrastructure for conf test and gatekeeper and the tree which I will show you in a moment. Opa is a general purpose policy engine, open general po- policy engine. And what happens is um, the idea of Opa is decoupling the policy decision making from the application logic. So what you can actually do is you can have a microservice that receives requests. And let's say Noah is trying to add a resource to some um, area of my website. Now the microservice that is responsible for it needs to decide, can I authorize Noah to actually perform this action? Now one option is that we actually do all of the authorization locally in the service and think like, can she do it? Can she not do it? And so on. Or we can have an external service. Now we can either buy build an authorization service or you can use open policy agent and Opa poli- open policy agent um, allows you to define policies and it can actually run as a, a policy engine um, as a service or as a library and you can actually uh, contact it via your service and ask can Noah perform this action so you either you bring it along as a library to every one of your services and then it locally accesses it or you can actually talk with it like with rest API and so on and it can be a central place to reach it and once you decide how you work with it you run a query and you say okay so I have this schema and I have this user trying to perform this action can the query is in JSON right? Yeah, th- but the language is Rego. Yeah. So the, the language that you write all the policies. And, and we can see now in the next slide that it is actually the way to, to write policies is in Rego. What is Rego? I've never heard of Rego before, but it's like a declarative language yeah. uh, that the open policy agent is using. And it's very, very popular now. Yeah. And you can actually push OPA policies into actually... centralized container management like docker registries which is really nice and you can see the example here that um, it's it's in a way you write it like tests so I talked about the authorization example but obviously you can also do a, a configuration test example so you download Opa you s- for example you start it as a service in this case you see Opa run minus service and then you give it in this case example dot rego and Which says that um, if a file is of type deployment and it doesn't have labels that are called app inside of it, it will fail because we want every resource to have a label and the w- label that we want is app. So yeah. then we can identify like which ingress and, and other stuff to, to, to put. So then we can contact the service and actually Opa will return a result and tell us whether we are okay. One, one sending the, the lower piece of uh, JSON mm-hmm. to tell us, is it okay or is it not okay? But if I understand correctly, um, OPA is not specifically to Kubernetes. I mean, uh, every example here is about resor- Kubernetes resources, but OPA is just a policy engine. You give yes. it a JSON and you write policies in Rego, but it's not, it, it's 
it's not related to Kubernetes at all. At all, at all. You could say that every user that has four bananas must have four apples. And if you don't have four apples with your four bananas, you can't do... <laughs> You can't eat a uh, chocolate because you haven't eaten all of your fruits <laughs> yet. So, uh, yeah, definitely you can write any policy you would like. Okay, so that leads us to ConfTest because OPA is, is really great. OPA is, is fantastic tool, but it also requires a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of configuration because for a company like OPA, Unicorn rental is it's not a tailored solution they need to put a lot of effort to write their policies and to download opa and to I don't know host it as a service or something and it's a lot of heavy li- lifting and a lot of work yep so especially when it comes to kubernetes policies so it's like let's take opa and do a domain specific solution on top of opa for a specific use case yeah yeah so um and ConfTest e, uh, Conf is an open source project. It allows us to write tests to any structured file. And when I say any, I mean <laughs> any. Uh, YAML, XML, JSON, Docker file, pretty much everything. Amazing. And it's specifically designed to, to be run uh, in the CI or as a local testing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's open. built on top of OPA. So basically when you run ConfTest, you use the engine in, um, in OPA. Uh-huh. And it also means that you need to write the policies in Rego because it's under the hood. Yeah, OPA. makes sense because this is what yeah. OPA talks. And something is that is very, very cool with ConfTest and um, most of the people don't know that ConfTest, um, you can push your policies to... to a Docker registry, and Con- ConfTest allows you to pull those policies from Amazing. the Docker registry. So it can have like a Docker service, like yeah. a service, it can have the Docker container and the policies for it. Yeah, Docker registries, not only for images. Yeah, <laughs> Revolu- revolutionary. Yeah, it's the new OCI standards. It's not that new anymore, but like it was new for me when I found out about it. Yeah, I think that you were the one that told me that. Yeah. So how to use ConfTest? Yeah. Um, first, we'll need to download ConfTest, of course. Then you'll need to start to write all the policies in Rego. And here we have the same example uh, as before. Now, ConfTest uh, looks for rules in Rego that can either be deny, violation, or warn. And you run the policies. So you, to run this policy, you need to execute uh, mm-hmm. ConfTest test with the path policy. Of the resource that you want to check for and you need to pull a uh, to put those policies in a folder that um, under the name policy mm-hmm. and if not that's okay you can pass a flag yeah and um, but this is the default behavior and now when you have our, our policies we have our resources and we run the conf test test we can see the results just, just like, like no JS tests or go tests just like no js tests Just everything like j- it's practically unit testing for Kubernetes resources and not Kubernetes any structure of the file yeah I'd call it any infrastructure as code file in a way yeah 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 because I think that the main difference with infrastructure as code files is that they're declarative and they're trying to give you the state th- the future and existing state of a s- resource yeah and the um, yeah that's I why your ego makes the most sense as a language yeah. I think so too, even though there are some like you can do some loops and stuff, but yeah, it's re- pretty basic, yeah, where I go it's <laughs> not, I prefer other languages, <laughs> but it's nice, it's very nice, yeah, so I think the easiest way to do is to integrate conf test directly, yeah, and if you want to run conf test in the c i because i th- I think in my opinion that's the real power of conf test and any other. Like unit testing library for your resources um because this is my policy as a developer um this is an example of um all the um recommended labels that Kubernetes uh, recommended itself for yeah, like the official from the docs yeah yeah mm-hmm. for uh, any Kubernetes uh, resource and so we created a policy just for that. And here we use the kitab action, and as you can see here, we pulled the policy from a registry from conf test. This is the path. 
Can you see it? It's, it's no, I, th- I think that's the container, and the one after it is putting no, the... No, this is the... Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's putting the container and the policy and, and running the test. And then we run Kuber- um, conf test test, cool. cube, and double asterisk. And that's it. This is practically anything that you need to do to run conf test. Feels like, you know, like running like a mocha or something with your files and your tests and... Yeah, it pretty much depends on how much policies do you want to write. If you yeah. Exactly like unit testing. If you will write more tests, it's, it's a lot of work, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what if I don't use the CI uh. or the CD? What if I just don't do push it. Don't do it. directly to the cluster don't do it. No, and there no. are no policies? No. What if I'm a criminal? <sighs> So I know that like specifically, you know, mainly operations and DevOps people, like they love to live on the runtime environment because they say, okay, so you have those text files that at the end of the day become binaries. And then someday they come to my kingdom, to the cluster. So at the end of the day, it's really good to run shift left and to tell developers before, you know, the mistakes happen so they can fix them before they get into production. But... Uh, in many cases, you also want like an active protection to run on the cluster. And for that, we have solutions like Gatekeeper. So Gatekeeper is actually also based on OPA, and it is also under the Open Policy Agent GitHub repository. And what uh, Gatekeeper does is it is a very, like, let's say OPA is a very general purpose solution for policies. ConfTest is is a more specific solution for infrastructure as code testing. Yeah. And Gatekeeper is really, really narrowed down to like policies on Kubernetes. It was a project that combined CNCF and OPA and Kubernetes and yeah. it was a big, big project, Gatekeeper. Um, it's a really nice project. I love it. And, and the idea from the Kubernetes side, it connects into uh, admission controllers of Kubernetes. So an admission controller is like hooks in operating systems in Windows or, God forbid, Windows, uh, in uh, Linux or, you know, Mac and st- Linux Foundation. Yeah. Uh, or let's say you can hook on a resource and tell the operating system, hey, if someone is u- doing this system call, please call me and I'll inspect it or tell you what to do with it. So it's exactly the same thing. When someone applies a policy, uh, applies a code, like applies instructions, I want to say, to the cluster, that's like kubectl apply, mm-hmm. or the cluster pulls it in a GitOps way from the repository, it then activates an admission controller. An admission controller has uh, several options of, of how to run. And um, we, we will show it in a moment that you submit to Gatekeeper code, and, and uh, now we're showing that you can submit code that tells it how to, what to test. And in this case, I'm not going to go over all the YAML inside of it. Of course, you can check it by yourself. But the idea is you give it a policy. In this case, we gave it the same policy to check that there are labels. And the difference is that it is being checked on top of the cluster in the moment that someone applies a resource change request to the cluster itself. And then Gatekeeper, using a Kubernetes admission controller webhooks, can allow or deny the change. Mm-hmm. So basically, you can take almost the same policies that you have in ConfTest, yeah, and you can see it put them in Gatekeeper. You can see it here. This is the this is the rego. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the same. Exactly, and then um, it will also run all the tests that you want, not only in the CI/CD pipeline, but also inside of the container. And you give it um, um, y- you build a uh, restriction. Um, policy and then you actually apply uh, the you have like a kind Kubernetes required labels and you apply uh, parameters or like where this policy should run on which types of resources and then the test runs when someone is trying to um, to go and apply a, a specific change so it's basically just to just to make sure I write a bunch of policies. I mm. put them in the cluster. So every time someone will uh, do kubectl cube apply, uh, it will go over all the policies, like like here. This is the constraint template. No, I'm sorry. This is the 
my own animations <laughs> are not behave. Uh, okay, so this is the policy. I just put all the policies in the cluster and then I write for every policy how I want, I would want to use to it. To use it. Exactly. Yeah, what, like what on a namespace, like on a plot and a pod. And, but it's, it's, it's like a replicas of the policies that I might have if I would mm -hmm. use conf tests. Yeah. Like I would have two of them. You, you could be the Ma same maybe, one. Maybe the same one. Ma maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. Because it's still, it's production. Yeah. I don't know. But I would have two times of the policies. Like yeah. One in the cluster and one in the conf test. Yes. If I would like to change one, I would need to change it in the cluster and in conf test. Yes. Right? Yes, that is okay. correct. Okay. Good. And the neat thing, which is a, a bit deeper into um, into Kubernetes, um, you should check out admission controllers. There is a mutation mutating webhook, and there is a applying webhook where, like, you can actually even also change um, yeah. resources that are applied. So imagine you could write. Um, I'm not sure if it's supported currently in Gatekeeper, but you could say every resource should have a a label or should have like a memory limit. Yeah. And then you can write a mutating webhook that says that would that change it. Yeah, yeah. That would automatically apply, I don't know, a 10 gigabyte uh, memory limit to this resource. Yeah. So it's also a neat way of using it. Yeah. And you can also check it um, in compare to your... Um, other resources like I would like I would like mm. to change to make sure that I have unique ingress uh, hosts oh yeah yeah and then so you can I will need to be aware yeah yeah and also gatekeeper have, have a lot of uh, features they have dry run and audit if you want just to validate that your policies uh, are correct and um, I really encourage you to check on that um, but yeah, I think I, I think I understand and I cool. totally agree. So, um, I think the final bit that you might ask yourself is, okay, so I understand why I need to run policy checks and I, you convinced me and you love policies and, and you showed me the tools that I can use in order to build it, conf test and gatekeeper and OPA in general. But then you ask yourself, but wait. Am I supposed to know all the post-mortems that happened? Like, how am I supposed to know which policies should I write? What are the best practices, yeah. may I ask? And then how do I make sure that all of the services are actually pulling the policies dynamically yeah. and auto-updating them? Maybe I have 400 services. How am I supposed to update all the policies for all of them? See which ones pass, which ones fail. How can I dynamically apply which types of policies should run on which types of resources? And different environment. Different environments, that's right. So for that, you have the tree. So if uh, you would like to check it out, we're an open source solution. Um, uh, and, and it actually basically does everything we just told you, only it comes predefined with policies out of the box. We read more than 100 post-mortems and worked with dozens of companies on unfortunate events that happened to them. And we took all of this wisdom and we codified it and we put it inside of our solution. And it is open source, written in Go, and you can run those checks against your Kubernetes manifests and Helm charts and verify that uh, the pre-built policies are passing or go and create your own custom policies. Yeah. To, to sum up, I, I, really want to, I really want you to remember uh, that sooner or later Kubernetes will become, I would like, uh, I, I always like to say your production temple, but it's not only about adapting Kubernetes because when you adapt Kubernetes, you adapt new culture to your organization. And as a, as a developer, I feel it way more than the DevOps engineer in your engineers in your organization. And you will spend time and resources on your Kubernetes, whether you would like it or not. Yeah. But Kubernetes is not, and DevOps, especially DevOps, is not something that happens overnight. Uh, it's, uh, it's a process, it takes time, and you really need to think about um, how do you want to manage it. And especially when it comes to uh, scale of terms of scale, it's something that is really, really important. And 
one of the most important things yeah, that I... Yeah, we can stop I sharing. Okay. And, and uh, first yeah. of all, I think that if you have any questions, feel free to ask us. And... Um, And we're hiring, so come join our team. You know, the regular plug, we're sorry, but uh, we're hiring. Uh, but I, I think that, you know, I saw uh, the Datadog study recently that more than 50% of all container environments run on Kubernetes. And it's wow. going up like this. Wow. Like this. So um, it's, it's not a question. It's a fact. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it's a fact. And Kubernetes... As I see it comes you know systems come whether they're adapted to be simply f- uh, simple or flexible and Kubernetes is adapted to be flexible which means that you can make a lot of mistakes and it's not that simple to manage it so I think that the same way as today every service has a CI CD solution yeah and and it's like of course you you're gonna build it and test it in CI CD and then ship it I think that the The next natural stage is that you have a policy engine inspect the changes before applying them to production because it has to be automated because there's just no way for me as a developer to remember to put all those things in place and to not make a mistake. I'm also a person. I'm also a human being. I make mistakes. I, I need some automated tool to actually go and check it for me. So make your lives easier. Make your developers' lives easier. Make your DevOps people's lives easier yeah. by automating it. Yes, make the world a better place. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Noah. It was great. Thank you, Shimon. We look forward to hearing from you and go check, out, check us out at thetree.io. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.